thanks everyone for, for being here. Thank you to Ingalls Elementary for hosting us. Uh, thank you to my colleagues who are also here. We'd like to recognize um, uh, my, my colleagues in city government, uh, City Council President Jay Walsh, uh, Ward 6 City Councilor Fred Hogan, City Council at Large and Chair of the City Council's Public Safety Committee, Brian Field. Ward 3 Councilor Coco Allen Sook. Also, uh, my colleagues on the Lynn School Committee, uh, who uh, we uh, were t talking about these issues uh, at, our, at our meeting last night and, and, and are, I know, committed to addressing them. Um, school Committee Member Tiffany Magnolia. School Committee Member Donna Coppola. School Committee Member Lorraine Gately. School Committee Member Lenny Pena. School Committee Member Brian Castellanos. And school committee member Eric Dugan. Also, our colleagues in, in state government, our delegation, uh, who I know are eager to partner with us on these issues and are uh, always available for any questions on uh, these issues and anything to do with the, the state level, uh, Senator Brendan Crichton, Representative Jenny Armini, Representative Dan Cahill and Representative Pete Capano. Thank you all for being here. Uh, we're going to hear later as well from our Essex County District Attorney, Paul Tucker, as well as our own Chief of Police, Chris Reddy, and Superintendent, Dr. Devon Alvarez. So thank you everyone for being here. I know that these conversations that we're having tonight are difficult, and so I just want to point out that if at any moment People need a second to breathe, some space. Know that the exits are back there. Uh, Link Community Health Center has uh, mental health professionals here uh, who will make themselves known uh, just outside. If you need to talk to a therapist or just need a, need a, need a breather, they're, they're here. So thank you, Link Community Health Center. Uh, the uh, faculty here, members of the faculty here at Ingalls have very generously volunteered to run some activities for kids. Um, so if there's any kids here that, that uh, need a distraction, they are outside with uh, some things for kids to do, and, and please feel free to take advantage of that. And thank you to the team at Ingalls for, for sharing that. <clears throat> we have food out here, uh, I hope you've uh, taken advantage of. Uh, thank you to EDIC for, for sponsoring that, as well as water, it's a donation from the um, Ready Cooperative Bank, thank you to them. Other resources that I just wanted to highlight uh, as you walk in, the Lynn Public Library listed and published a uh, list of books resources for, for children and teens and caregivers that uh, are made, that's available out there if you're looking for, for resources. Uh, there's a lot of organizations here represented, um, a few of them uh, that have uh, set up resources out on the side in the, uh, just outside the auditorium, Children Family Services, Lynn Public Schools Welcome Center, our own uh, City Hall has a variety of resources that are um, out in front on the table there, as well as the Lynn Police Department has a list of uh, lots of different ways to contact them. So uh, we have uh, published in advance the agenda for this evening. We also have copies on the way, and hopefully you've seen it, and know that we're gonna start here, uh, welcoming you all. We're then gonna turn it over to, to Raw Arts, uh, that we're gonna lead us in a, exercise and uh, turn it over to Riverside, uh, who is generally offered to, to share their, uh, some information on, on some resources and, and uh, ideas for folks that are struggling with the impact of this trauma on their, their well-being and those are the ones they care about. And then we will have a uh, community conversation later after those two uh, portions. The, the goal, the overall goal, as we've communicated, is to create a space here in this room tonight to mourn the lives that have been lost, to uh, reflect on what's happened, to process, to, to process that together, and to talk about next steps. 
So if we, before we start that, I would like to, uh, to ask all of you to please join me in a moment of silence for the lives that have uh, been taken. Uh, John Real Heredia, Abraham Diaz, Daniel Marquez Santelis, and, and all our victims. A sign in sheet uh, where you can sign up to, to uh, keep in touch about next steps. We've also published, many of you have filled out already, a survey to submit questions, which we appreciate all that we have received so far. If you haven't done that yet, um, there's a little flyer here with the QR code to the link where you can submit that electronically. There's also note cards as you walk in to submit uh, questions and thoughts the old-fashioned way, and we will collect those. <clears throat> we uh, want to give you plenty of time to do that, so that we be part of our what we expect folks to be doing in addition to the uh, arts exercise that Raw will be leading. If, if you want to take that time to fill out your questions as well, we will collect them after that. On, we're going to make every effort to respond to these questions. Uh, we're going to start with a guided conversation from uh, my colleagues that will hit uh, the main questions that we've received uh, most commonly. And then after going through that, you know, we'll open it up for those questions that uh, folks still would like to cover. Of course, we will keep track of all the questions submitted uh, and read through those. and do our best to address all of those issues. But we, we won't be able to get to every question verbatim that, that's submitted through these surveys, and I uh, just wanted to make that clear. So before I turn it over to Ra and ask them to lead us in that exercise, I just want to make a couple of points uh, from my perspective. First, I want to say that the violence that we have experienced over the last couple of weeks is not okay. Any violence is troubling. And this recent spate of incidents has been particularly worrisome and has alarmed us. Second, we need to acknowledge the complexity of this problem. If there was an easy solution to make it go away, that's what we'd do. It'd be that easy. However, while I accept the complex and challenging nature of the problems, that also doesn't mean that we are helpless. It doesn't mean that we are hopeless. I genuinely embrace the idea that we as a community control our own destiny and that our collective efforts together will determine our future. I imagine, I imagine a lot of you feel the same way. And that's why you've made the effort to be here tonight, to be part of that, to show ourselves and to show this city that we're going to take care of each other. Because it's exactly the hardest problems, like community violence, that demand the most collaboration. If we all think about what went wrong for any one of these incidents, it's weapons in the wrong hands, and it's men and boys taking the wrong path. Keeping weapons out of the wrong hands is the daily responsibility of the police department, and we can all be helpful in a supportive fashion in that work. Keeping men and boys, really all of our young people, on a right path is all of our work, every day. Feelings of helplessness, feelings of hopelessness, the feeling of defeat that you might have if you were just going to say that 
this violence is just the way things are. It's just how it is. Those feelings are exactly the feelings that evil preys on to take others down the wrong path. And we need to reject those feelings. Solutions that work need to build, it needs to build on what exists already. A lot of people in this city have been working hard for years to respond to and to prevent violence. A lot of people do that work every day. That's one of the reasons why we prepared a list of resources. It's also available out front. It's got various efforts that are ongoing with the contact information of the different programs. Not because we think that's enough, but in order to develop a shared understanding of what's already happening so that we can build on it. I don't want anyone's lives to be disrupted by violence. I don't want innocent victims to be hurt. I don't want any neighborhood's sense of safety to be shattered. I don't want any family to lose their loved ones to violence or to a life of crime or both. We want to stop violence in its tracks. We want to give all of our young people a bright future, and importantly, that means good alternatives to bad decisions and negative lifestyles. In order to do that, I believe that we need to allow folks to heal and process the trauma that has occurred, and that's one of the reasons we've asked Raw to help, and they've generously offered. So I'd like to uh, call uh, the team from Raw Arts up to begin their exercise. Thank you. so much for being here. Uh, this is a hard moment to show up, and I think the fact that we're looking out and seeing so many beautiful and committed faces uh, means that everyone who's here is invested and loves the city of Lynn. So thank you for being here, and uh, we know this is an incredibly challenging moment for the city of Lynn, and so um, at RAW, what we try to do is use art and the strength of, this, of our community, of the community at RAW and the community of Lynn, um, to just continue to imagine solutions. Um, and to all the feelings that you're feeling right now, um, they are valid and they're big. Um, and so we're gonna take a couple minutes just to uh, spend some time creating together, uh, focus together, imagining, um, you know, what it is that we want the city of Lynn to look like for the young people of the city of Lynn, for this beautiful community. And, um, There's really no wrong way to do that. Um, today, it's, it's about using colors and images and shapes, um, but also looking around and recognizing that these are the people who are here to, to build this together. Uh, I'd like to just bring uh, Jason Cruz and Michelle La Poetica to our space uh, energetically, who really did help form uh, today's activity, warm up, um, in Jay's words, uh, he wrote, we hope this process will allow you moments of focus and stillness and allow you to see the beauty inside yourself in this city. By creating this work of art, we hope that you will be reminded of the small actions to create the city you envision for all citizens of Lynn. Um, I'd like to say that we are not uh, expecting this to heal anything in this moment right now. Um, if anything, we can use the art to ground ourselves to root ourselves in what's most meaningful for us right now. Um, and we also uh, planned on having tables in front of us. And so <laughs> we will ask for just a, a little bit of support if you are able to, or um, just patience as we get materials out and around. Um, so we have two guiding prompts. Um, I'll let Laura. Sure, the, the first one is really um, kind of what we were just naming is using art 
materials, thinking about uh, what would it look like for a young person to walk down the streets of Lynn that you really want to imagine. Um, and we'll press these out as well with the materials. Um, and if you could create an image of love for the city of Lynn right now, what would that look like? And we can read those um, actually. Oh, there is translation happening as well. Translation. Yeah. OK, so um, we have paint pens, sharpies, and markers. Sorry. We have paint pens, sharpies, and markers in cups. Um, so if, if drawing feels intimidating to you, know that line, shape, and color can tell a story. Um, sometimes words aren't enough. Sometimes words don't make any sense with what you're trying to express. However, if there's a word that's just like coming to you and it feels really important, like maybe that is the center or focus, um, this could be a piece of art that you take with you. This could be a piece of art, there's several unfortunate altars around uh, the city. Um, they could be placed there. Uh, they could be reminders of uh, the night that Lynn came together to have real conversations that are hard um, and sometimes scary. Um, and art is a, a beautiful way to armor up. Um, so with that, uh, we'll give folks a few minutes to get some materials and you'll have the pumps in front of you. And really at RAW we say there's no mistakes, just art. Um, so if it's a big, huge mess that you make, like that is that's where you're at, and that's where what we will accept um, for art making tonight. I think one thing to note, they are Sharpies and paint pens, so you want to try to keep those as contained as possible on the um, canvas or the little piece of wood that we'll hand out. Um, they're a little tricky to get out of place. I'm going to invite everyone like that. right now to actually just pause with their art making, if you could cap the pen. And if I could just have your attention my beautiful community. If we could just take a collective breath together, come to this space for what we know will be um, a heavy evening for some of us in the room. Um, so I'm just gonna invite everyone to take a nice breath in and out. We'll do one more, breathing in, out. Quick trick, if you breathe in through your nose and out through your mouth, making your exhale a little bit longer, that can really help regulate your nervous system, calm down a bit. And we just wanted to invite anyone popcorn style, you could stand, you can shout it out, um, but if there is a word that you wanna offer, share with your community, um, or if there's a word, a feeling word, that you want to just validate that you're feeling, that you know the community's feeling, um, feel free to just shout that word out. Um, I will start, uh, and my word is unity tonight. Safe. Peace. Hope. Safe. Hope. Power. Action. Action. Healing. Peace. Peace. Frustration. Yes. Enough is enough. Mm -hmm. Anger. 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 Sadness. Confusion. Do Afraid. something. Afraid. Right now. Act. Support for city officials. Support city officials. Accountability. Mm. Fear. How about a, a united praying? That's what we need. We need Pray. the Lord. Yes. Amen, brother. That's what we need. All of us. Bring God to school. And collectively. And be. Bring the Bible to school. Amen. Bring respect to school. Those are the real core values. Okay, I'm for you. Any last words that folks want to share? Respect. Respect. Let's end with respect Amen. so that we can complete this evening with that respect. Um, I, sorry, I am very proud of my community. I am very proud of people showing up on their Friday evenings to come together to be brave and make art, which truly does take bravery. 
Um, I'm gonna pass this mic um, to Rosario, who's our executive director. Um, or, I'm sorry, I'm just introducing Rosario, who is here as our new executive director. Please find her. Um, we want to be um, as involved as we can be. Um, if your child is interested in RAW, obviously, um, reach out to us. Um, with that, I am going to hand mic to Laura, who's going to introduce the next section of tonight. Thank you so much, everyone. Um, after the Riverside Trauma Center has um, shared some, we will come around and collect the markers and the art materials. But if you'd like to continue creating um, as you're listening, please feel free to do so. Thank you so much to the Raw Arts team. Thank you. Thanks for everybody for uh, participating and joining us in that, in the exercise and in the, um, the comments. Uh, we really appreciate it and are grateful to have you here and working with us uh, on, on these issues. So the next, the next item on our uh, agenda here in our plan is uh, Riverside. They have uh, volunteered to share some reflections, some expectations on what some of you may be feeling and also resources for those of you who have been impacted by, by trauma. Uh, they're experts in these uh, sorts of situations and we're uh, very grateful to be able to welcome them tonight. Thank you. Good evening, my name is Liz Georgiakopoulos and I work at the Riverside Trauma Center. I'm here to talk to you a little bit about what might be happening in your body, in your heart, in your head, following these traumatic events that have taken place over the last few weeks. Some things have already been said, ways that we're feeling. We might be in fear, disbelief. We might be disoriented. We might need more information, and hopefully we get some of that tonight. So it's good to sit and think about your own feelings, talk to other people about how you're feeling, how your reactions are happening for you, and be supportive of each other in our community together in the city. In times like this, I like to tell people that we need to give everyone else grace and space. We are all going to react differently to these events depending on everything that has happened in our history. If someone is reacting in a way that does not sit well with you, give them the grace to react in that way, as long as everyone is safe. We wanna give each other space to have our own feelings and space to come together like we are doing tonight to express those feelings and to come together in a common ground. Some reactions that you might be feeling in six different realms could be emotional, cognitive, behavioral, physical, relational, or spiritual. These are all the different ways that we might be feeling our reactions to these traumatic events. We might be in shock, we might be confused. We might be irritable or have trouble sleeping. We might feel fatigued or exhausted. We might feel a stomach ache or a headache or tightness in our chest. Our body can hold on to all of those feelings that we are having as well. We may feel ourselves withdrawing from things that we normally like to do, trying to be alone, or forcing ourselves to interact with other people. And we might be asking the question, why? Trying to find meaning in the greater purpose of what is going on here, or thinking that perhaps nothing matters. All of these are appropriate ways to feel in the face of a traumatic event. And I encourage you to lean into those feelings. If you try to push them down or push them away, they'll still be in your body and you'll experience them in different ways. So really lean into those feelings and do things that help you to feel happy or grounded. 
For some of you, the art making that we did tonight might be a great way to help yourselves feel grounded in the moment, to get some of those emotions out of our bodies. Maybe it's going for a walk. Maybe it's having coffee with our best friend. Do the things right now that make you happy and that bring you joy and peace because that is gonna help you process your emotions and really start to work through how you're feeling in these moments. I know we have some children in the room, so I wanna take some time to address any parents that are here or caregivers that are here. In looking at how we're talking to our children about these traumatic events, we want to make space to listen to our kids, to allow them to open up and share how they're feeling, and not just reflect the feelings that we're having. You want to listen to them, even if you don't agree with what they're saying or how they're feeling. You want to get those open lines of communication so that you can really start to help them also process how they're feeling in these moments. Focus on their safety making sure that they're safe and they understand how to be safe in different spaces, like at school or in your home. I would also encourage you to really look at what's happening on their social media, perhaps limiting their access to social media, taking a break from social media, as this is where a lot of rumors tend to spiral around. This applies to us as adults as well, right? If reading what's happening in this Facebook group of Lynn that I'm sure exists, right, is not feeling good for you, put it down. Put it on mute, walk away, okay? Really limiting how much information that you're taking in, if it's not good for you, is important to know. When we're talking about our children, we wanna watch for behavior changes. Sometimes there will be regression in behaviors. Uh, for our younger kids, you might see that come through as bedwetting or needing to be closer in proximity to a parent or a loved one. Maintaining your routines is really important. If you get up every Saturday and go to soccer or football, please keep doing that. Those routines help the children to feel grounded because they know what to expect. Keep that door open for communication with your kids and really have that conversation about safety and violence. And as the mayor said, we wanna keep kids on the right path, right? So talk about making good choices. Talk about who they're spending their time with. Talk about what their hopes and dreams are for the future so that they really stay grounded in those moments and start to make those good choices. The last thing I wanted to touch on is practicing self-care. Our art making activity is one of the things that we can do uh, for that self-care. Maintaining social connections, people that you feel comfortable talking to about how you're feeling about these traumatic events are very important. You wanna engage in health-promoting behaviors. Get up and go to the gym if that's something that you like to do. Now is not the time to start a new day of going to the gym or saying, I'm gonna get into shape today. Now is a time to really lean into our routines or things that we already do that help us to feel better. Having a cup of tea and reading a book, knitting or crocheting, going to church or synagogue, if that's what is helpful for you. Try to get enough sleep. Limit your caffeine intake and really focus on making sure that you are well rested so that you can support the others around you as well. And finding that balance in our lives, trying to make sure that we're not working too much or doing things to distract ourselves so much from how we're feeling but really leaning into that and having these hard conversations like we are having tonight. All of these are gonna be ways to help you process these feelings, these emotions, physical, mental, in your heart, okay? We are here to provide support for anyone who might need it. We can offer um, some stabilization sessions for folks or coping groups for folks. I'll be around after 
the presentation if you would like to come talk to me about those options. We also have folks from the Lynn Community Health Center here, um, and you also have a CBHC in your neighborhood, Elliott, where you can get more long-term mental health services. Okay, if you have any questions, I'm here to help answer them, and I welcome any other questions when we get to that portion of the evening. Thank you. Thank you so much, Beth, and thank you for the Riverside team for being here and for sharing those resources. We really appreciate it. Thank you. So now we're going to begin the, the community conversation portion of the evening. Uh, so we'll, we'll start as I'll start by asking uh, some of my colleagues here to, to share some opening remarks, and we'll start diving into questions um, that we've received over the last couple of days and, and this evening um, and before we, we open it up. So we'll start by uh, inviting uh, the Chief of Police of the Lynn uh, Police Department, Chief Ray. Good evening. I want to thank you all for joining us here tonight to share your concerns and help us to begin the process of healing in response to these horrific crimes that our community has experienced recently. We understand that these acts of violence, these acts of violence cause significant harm. Families are grieving the loss of loved ones. Victims are recovering from the physical and emotional and mental trauma that they experience as a result of these incidents, and members of our community are experiencing heightened levels of fear, fear for themselves, for their families, for their neighborhoods. We are aware of this and we are working hard in response to bring justice to those victims and to this community. We know that these incidents have been not random, they are targeted attacks, but innocent bystanders have been victimized just the same. I've said before that no family should have to experience the grief that these families are currently going through. Gun violence is a problem throughout our nation. It is certainly a problem in urban communities and it's a problem in our community. Although the gun violence is a national problem, the impact is felt, felt most significantly on the local level. Every day, officers from the Lynn Police Department work proactively at personal risk, in many cases, to identify and arrest those who engage in these crimes. So far this year, we have responded to 26 incidents of gunshots, shots fired. And we have seized 36 firearms. As awful as the, that those statistics are, it's actually a significant improvement from 2022 when we responded to 52 incidents of shots fired and seized 75 firearms. Investigators from the Lynn Police Department and the Massachusetts State Police have been working tirelessly on the investigations from these most recent incidents. And they are making progress. When this first happened, I asked for the community's help. I asked if you knew something or if you had some information to please help us. You're part of the response. I am so grateful to say you did respond. We have received multiple ring camera videos and other source video. We've received numerous tips, and we want you to continue to do that. Those, that information, those videos, and those tips have helped us to move these investigations forward, and they have been very effective and helpful. I'm asking you to continue to share what you know. If you think somebody else already passed something along, pass it along anyway. If you think it's inconsequential, pass it along anyway. We would rather have it and be able to review it and see that it's redundant than not have it at all. So please continue to respond the way you have. I'm grateful to you and I thank you and uh, I'm asking you to continue to be part of the solution. In addition, we have also responded by increasing our patrols uh, to try to bring increased visibility and address some of the issues in our neighborhoods. We've had a particular focus on the uh, areas of our schools, middle schools and high schools especially, uh, during the dismissal and arrival periods. These patrols have included both marked unit, uniform patrols, as well as plain clothes patrols. 
and we've added additional overtime resources to supplement them. In fact, in one recent af afternoon, Detective Jen Cash was on patrol observing kids after the dis during the dismissal period when she observed, observed a juvenile male with a machete. She called for backup and acted and initiated the stop of that male and his associates. After they had committed that stop, we found out that they had just committed a robbery. They were quickly identified and taken into custody. So these efforts have been effective and we're going to continue to do them. And I appreciate her effort and the effort of all those officers who are committed to trying to bring safety and security and comfort to the students and the teachers in our community. We have also, um, one of the other incidents I, uh, I want to make you aware of, uh, or one of the other issues, is that those students that were stopped in that afternoon with the machete are gang, are gang involved. Almost every incident of violence we've experienced recently has been gang involved. We have experienced an increase in gang activity, particularly in our young teens, and especially in the last year. We have been responding by increase, adding increased patrols. We've uh, partnered with the state police and federal law enforcement agencies to engage in both short-term and long-term investigations to target impact players, especially those older members who are driving the actions of the younger members. And we're gonna continue to do that. We're also working with organizations like LISOA and ROCA to engage in outreach to ask risk, at risk youth, those who are on the cusp of going the wrong way, and to try to steer them to a better path, a more productive life. We have tremendously strong partnerships with those organizations. And we also work with local institutions and organizations like the Stop the Violence Program to send the message that this is not the way to go. Gun violence, any act of violence, is not going to be a successful path in life. That work will never end, and we're committed to continuing those partnerships and that collaborative. We also have a very strong partnership with the Lynn School Department. We have excellent communication, and we work jointly to develop security procedures that will ensure that our students, our faculty, and the staff can feel safe and secure in their school. We've, I've worked with and had communications with Dr. Alvarez to discuss about new technology, and new programs that we're going to bring in to enhance those uh, resources. We've added an additional SRO. We now have, we've had SROs in every middle school for a number of years. You know, we've had added one to one high school, and our goal, our hope, uh, as we increase our staffing, that we can add SROs into the other high schools as well. I'm grateful for the partnership with the Loon School community. It's been really an important one, and it's helping us to help those students feel safe so that they can learn. I pledge to you today that we are committed to continuing to do the work and that we believe that you are part of uh, the response. As I said, I'm grateful for what you've done so far and we're continuing to, we'll look forward to continuing that support from you. We are committed to doing everything possible to ensure that the individuals who cause this violence are brought to justice. Thank you. much, Chief Reddy. I would now like to introduce uh, the Essex County District Attorney, Paul Tucker. Thank you, Mayor. Good afternoon, everybody. Let me just say first, what an extraordinary view I have from where I'm standing right now. This is what a caring community looks like. This is what happens when people come together to fight the scourge of violence. Any remarks that I could make, and I wrote a few down, I think will pale in comparison to what I heard during the RARAT project that we did a little bit earlier. Listening to the concerns of the community, the fear, the anger, the need for accountability, the need for prayer, all of the above and more. I was at the scene the morning after the incident at 189 Essex Street with the mayor, with the police chief. Now, let me just say first, the extraordinary work that the Lynn Police Department has done, second to none. 
extraordinary work under very, very difficult circumstances. What also struck me was going into the yard at 189 Essex with the chief and with the mayor and speaking with the family. And if I could characterize what that conversation sounded like when we spoke with them, particularly the chief and the mayor speaking with the family, to show our concern, to make sure they knew that they were not alone. I think the words that we heard here tonight in that beginning, the opening here, are the same words that you'd hear from the family. My job as district attorney is to do everything I can to make communities feel safe and to be safe. It's a balancing act. It's a balancing act between bringing justice, which sometimes means punishment, and making sure it's done appropriately and when it's needed, and also balancing when to give somebody a second chance. When it comes to the punishment piece, particularly when it comes to gun violence, we have what we call priority prosecutions. In Lynn, we have a gun court to expedite the cases, to make sure that people who belong in the system are not back out on the street. The chief mentioned people that we call impact players. Here's what we know. We know that a very small percentage of people are responsible for a large percentage of the crime. And I can tell you that the Lynn PD and the state police assigned to my office, the Essex County District Attorney's Office, are trying to identify and make sure we bring those folks to justice. The other side of that coin is programs like juvenile diversion. It's making sure that we give people second chances who deserve second chances. We see this a lot with the opiate epidemic. There's a big difference between somebody who's in the grip of addiction, who needs our help, who needs recovery, and somebody who's trafficking in fentanyl. We do the same thing with these violent people who are bringing, tearing the fabric of our committees and our communities apart. We also have partnered with LISOA, working with the folks who are on the ground. It's an interesting balance that we have when a law enforcement is working with folks who are working with the at-risk youth on the street. That's important. Here's what we can't do. We can't lose a generation of kids. We can certainly try to arrest our way out of this and lock everybody up and lose a generation of kids. That's not the answer. The answer is to make sure we identify who we can help, make sure we have the programs in place. We have after-school programs in Lynn. We have a whole host of things. We have folks that are standing ready to help. We need to make sure we identify those kids and get them that help. Let me leave you with this. Last week in Lawrence, we had a 19-year-old woman who was shot to death. 19-year-old woman, just beginning her life. The person responsible for that shooting in Lawrence was 14. Let that sink in for a minute. What happened in that 14-year-old's life that led him to commit that act? Think about the ripple effect. One person lost their life, but in essence it was really two, because the family of that 14-year-old, they've lost that young man as well. We need to redouble our efforts. We need to make sure that when we leave here this evening, that everyone here hears the message to do all that we can. Let's not lose a generation of young people. Let tonight be the call to make sure we start to turn things around. Thank you. Thank you, uh, District Attorney Tucker. Next, we would like to ask uh, Superintendent Dr. Alvarez um, to, to share uh, a few words. One of the things I just want to say uh, in advance of that is that as we've reviewed the questions uh, that were submitted in advance, and, and I've kept an eye on those that have, that have been submitted so far tonight, uh, one one thing that I, I would like to point out on behalf of the city as we start as we turn it over to the superintendent, uh, clearly uh, parents and families care deeply about the safety of, and well-being of their students and entrust their students to the care of the public schools during the school day. The city takes full responsibility of, of public safety for our community and it is a incredibly close and effective partnership I think between the, the police department and the city as a whole and the Olympic public schools and we just want to point out that 
for a lot of the concerns that, that parents specifically are, are directing towards the school department. They're, they're important concerns, they're valid concerns, they're issues that we're working on, and a lot of that is coordination with, with public safety and happening outside of our school buildings. And I think an example of some of these incidents with that, that they affect our students' learning without a doubt through the incidents that happen in these neighborhoods. Uh, we want to make clear to people in these times especially uh, what is targeting schools and school related and what is happening outside in the community. So I just wanted to, to, make, to, to, to share that first. Dr. Alvarez. Good evening. Buenas noches. Uh, the school department is has been meeting um, the entire summer to ensure that we create um, a revision in a lot of the safety measures and procedures to collectively bring uh, and restore, right, not only create culture and a sense of belonging to make, but ensure that students feel safe. Learning does not happen without students feeling safe. Teachers cannot teach if they do not feel safe. Administrators cannot run buildings if they cannot ensure the safety of students and staff. So, um, collectively there has been a committee and a group of us that have been meeting regularly. Uh, we have done a number of things that I do want to share with you this evening. A revision that is uh, in process still of the student handbook to include things like model behaviors, um, how we reward behaviors that are model behaviors, expectations of behaviors and progressive discipline so that we are giving students opportunities, yes, to make mistakes, but also to learn from their mistakes. Um, we are improving our accident and emergency preparedness, uh, including communication to families so that we can quickly let parents know what is happening and when it is happening along with the staffs that are in our school buildings. We are minimizing administrative response times for those emergencies as well in collaboration with our SROs and Chief Reddy and the entire police, uh, Lynn Police Department. We are also um, decreasing, we are trying, very obviously looking at our numbers and measuring ourselves, right? Making sure that we hold ourselves accountable for decreasing and minimizing the number of incidents um, through restorative practices. So along with that, uh, last night at the school committee meeting, one of the policies that was um, passed to now move forward to the administrative process of how we conduct protective sweeps in our schools so that we can identify very quickly students that may be carrying an illegal weapon and how do we manage those incidents um, so that students are not hurt in the process and that administrators or teachers are not hurt in the process. Uh, we are also uh, have started the process of implementation of a school security system that uh, is through a company called Mercata that uses artificial intelligence and basically that will um, include the wiring and installation of additional safety and security cameras in our buildings along with identification of students that may be vaping, have, we have environmental concerns in our buildings uh, because of it, and the quick identification of any person that does not belong in a building at any given time. Um, it also has a mechanism to be able to lock down very quickly uh, doorways and entryways so that we can secure staff and students when we need to. So again, uh, the goal really is not only to take a proactive approach, but to lessen that reactive approach and to minimize the number of incidents that we um, have been experiencing in our school buildings over the past two years. And as we continue to work through these actions, we do anticipate that uh, the incidents will decrease and we want to be accountable. We will share numbers and data with you as we go through not only the beginning of this year, but through uh, mid-year progress, as well as at the end of closing our school year, and providing those supports and social, emotional, and clinical interventions for students that do need it, um, as well as their families and caregivers. 
So we are always uh, open, or my door is open, always open. The entire district leadership team is always open to your questions. And we have with us this evening um, two of our deputies, Marisol Gores, who is overseeing our grades 6 through 12 specifically. Uh, Ms. Deb Ruggiero, which is, uh, oversees facilities, um, some of our elementary schools, and is also my designee. We have Tina Hufnagel, who is our executive director for social and emotional learning here. And in the lobby, you probably met and have met Yvette Martinez, who um, is one of our administrators at the Welcome Center. So we are all here to support you and answer your questions this evening as well. Um, we have our exec and we also have an executive director for curriculum and instruction, uh, Molly Cohen. I know she's here. Not sure. I can't see her, but all maybe all the way in the back. Um, again, my door is open. All of our emails and our website has been updated. Um, everything is on there, so we have a whole new. Um, site where you can reach us very easily if you have any questions or you have concerns and again we look forward to continued communication on an ongoing basis thank you Um, so, like I mentioned, we have been reviewing the questions that have been submitted, and we're going to start by running through some of the, the most common and uh, the, the sort of major themes that were hit on in the questions. Um, and so, uh, one obvious one uh, that has certainly come out up a lot is, what are, what are we going to do? What is the plan to address this? Uh, so, I just, I want to let everyone know that this is something we're constantly thinking about and working on. When these incidents are happening, uh, I'm in constant communication uh, with the chief, with the superintendent, uh, with, the, with the district attorney, with our uh, colleagues on the, on the council and at the state level, uh, and it's something we're always talking about and have been uh, thinking about how to address this. Uh, it's something that I've been reaching out to, to other folks as well, other mayors who have experience on these issues of communities have uh, grappled with these issues uh, and of course we want to get input from the community and so that's one of the goals tonight uh, is to get folks input um, and, and, and coming up with a plan I can tell you some of the things that we're looking at now from the city's perspective in order to make investments, uh, the city uses uh, flock cameras on the street to help identify and track vehicles that are of interest. Uh, and there uh, is a potential to increase the coverage of those flock cameras with additional purchases. We're looking at uh, potential funding sources for increasing of, of certain types of patrols, particularly community uh, patrols, community policing, increasing. We have teen dropout centers, places to go for, for uh, teenagers on the weekends, uh, and we're looking at funding to increase the either the number of those or the timing of those, the availability of those, uh, for to give our young people a place to go with, with, with uh, a structured, supportive environment, as well as uh, working with community groups to try to be proactively uh, reaching out out to particular streets, hotspots, places where we want to build the relationship and proactively going out and, and knocking on doors in partnership with the with the ward counselor, with uh, the, the mayor's office, with neighbors, whoever wants to be part of that effort to, to reach out to people and let them know some of the resources that are available. You saw the list, hopefully, as you walked in. There's a lot of folks in our community uh, who are there to help for different needs, and we want to make sure that the, the, the places that uh, are experiencing those needs are aware of those resources. And one of the things that we always deal with and think about is, 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 is how to reach people, because it, it's, it's hard. It's, 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 it's hard to, people are busy, people are under a lot of stress. It's an incredibly difficult time for a lot of different reasons and we want to make every effort to get in front of folks and sometimes that takes a knock on the door. 
another really common question that we, we, we get, and I think folks intuitively, intuitively understand that the long-term solution to this is, is reaching young people in the right moments when they're making those decisions and starting to put together their lives. And so there's a lot of questions about after school programming. We know that the Loom Public Schools do amazing work during the day, and, and there's a lot of uh, parents and caregivers who are, who are working, who, who uh, aren't around in the afternoons or evenings, and those programs are so valuable and great partners to the Loom Public Schools and to the city. You'll see on the sheet that we're very fortunate to have uh, several after school programs in the city uh, that we support in various ways. The community development uh, department uh, makes funding available and there's a lot of larger organizations that have a, a wonderful presence here in Lynn. And so I, I hope that you will, uh, for those of you who are interested in what is currently available, I hope that you will take a look at, at that. And I also, uh, want to share some really exciting news that was delivered to uh, me and I think a lot of folks this morning that the uh, Lynn YMCA, the board of directors have uh, announced that they are going to offer free memberships to the Y to all 7th and 8th graders in the city of Lynn. Thank you so much to Andrea Baez, who is here tonight, uh, and to our entire team. Thank you. So another um, question that uh, we, we received that we want to touch on is uh, for the chief, and it is, do we currently have a gang unit from the police department that is out on these streets to tackle these gang issues? Uh, thank you. Yes, we do have a gang unit. In fact, Sergeant Michael Gorman, who's sitting right over here, is the leader of that unit. Uh, in the past year, we've had, actually added additional personnel to that unit, and we've also strengthened, as I mentioned earlier, our relationship and our working partnerships with the state police gang unit and other state police units, as well as federal law enforcement agencies. Um, in addition to that, uh, Mike and his team work regularly with some of the other providers, and, and, uh, such as LISOA and ROCA and the Stop the Violence program to uh, engage in outreach. And uh, as the mayor said, it's not just one path. We're not just going to arrest us. If we can divert kids to a more positive path, uh, they absolutely take that as part of their, uh, how they respond to this issue. I just want to add that uh, sitting next to uh, Sergeant Goldman, right behind him, Lieutenant Tim Donovan from our Youth Services Unit, who also is really the face of our uh, engagement with the Lynn School community. Him and his team uh, really communicate with school administrators from the uh, schools on a regular basis. That's why those bonds are so strong, and we can identify problems, refer kids, work with families, and again, try to get young people on a better path um, so that we don't have them become either the victims or the offenders down the road. That's always our emphasis, but uh, they do tremendous work in that area. Thank you, Chief, and thank you to the team for your, for your work. Uh, so I think this one is for the Chief and did just return if you, have, if you want to weigh in as well. Um, and you, you, you covered this a little bit in your remarks, and, and, I, and I want to say that I think that's true for, for some of this as well. And I, I also want um, folks to, to be able to, to hear their, their questions. And so uh, for, for, forgive us if, if there's anything repetitive here, but I think they're important questions, and um, in some cases, bears repeating. So uh, how many City of Lynn reported shootings have there been in the past year? How many fatalities, and how does that compare to previous years? And I think if you, if you want to take that opportunity as well to just sort of think about the, the, the bigger picture in terms of what we're seeing, both for, for either of you. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so uh, so far, as I mentioned earlier, so far in 2023, there's been uh, 26 reported incidents of shots fired. We see 35, 36 firearms. We've had three incidents of homicide uh, with four victims. In 2022, there were 52 incidents of shots fired. 
with 75 firearms seized. We had four incidents of homicide with seven victims. We have cleared three out of the four cases from 2022. And we have cleared, so far, one of the three cases from 2023. And that work is ongoing, and, it, and we've already committed, we're gonna work tirelessly to bring justice to the, those victims and their families as well. Um, but, as I mentioned, gun violence is, is a problem throughout our communities. I'm encouraged that uh, we haven't had as many incidents this year, but by no means are we resting on that. It's still troubling to have 26 shots fired incidents in this community. Uh, the work continues and we're committed to it. Thank you, Chief. We do track all of these statistics very closely, and as the Chief said, uh, we know what the numbers are, the numbers speak for themselves, but I think it's important to know that behind every one of those numbers are real people, and the Chief also mentioned there's a couple of the, of the cases that we're here for tonight that are in the what we call the unsolved category. I can tell you, watching what Lynn PD is doing every single day without stop, and the detectives from our state police unit, they're on these, they're working tirelessly, and hopefully we'll have some good news soon on those as well. Thank you. So uh, this one is for the chief, and then I'll, I'll chime in as well. How are members of the community supposed to hear about emergency situations and steps to take uh, besides Facebook and email, and I, and I think in part responding specifically to, to what happened this week? Uh, right, so first I would encourage you to like the mayor's page, like uh, the Lynn Police Department's social media, so you can get access that way, but if that is not, uh, an option for you. Um, there are other means I'll talk about. I want you to know that when we have an incident like what happened on Commercial Street the other day, uh, we are making assessments of what type of notification needs to go out to and who. We don't want to overly alarm the entire city if only a certain area of the city is impacted. Uh, and those are challenging decisions and they're made in the moment. We try to be as thoughtful, but also as, as cautious. Uh, we work very closely with Dr. Alvarez's team to keep them informed. Uh, when the schools are in a secure and hold, and I know that she has a really good, tr tremendous program for getting information out to parents. Um, so we do have a really cooperative effort, and the mayor and I have talked about how to enhance those, uh, and, and I know the city council president has asked me about it as well. We're gonna work on enhancing those measures. Yes, thank you. So uh, this is, is clearly something in an area that we've, been, that we've been trying to improve on. Um, the. Like I said, it can be hard to reach people, and we need to reach people in those in those really important moments. So, uh, and it, we, it, so the social media, as the chief mentioned, both the Lynn Police Department, the City of Lynn has its own page, the Mayor's Office, and and other folks. Uh, we have an email list that you can sign up for. Um, obviously, for the for the school department, uh, they you use very effectively School Messenger as a way to communicate with families. Uh, the City of Lynn also has a smart 911. Uh, system and so we have some information available uh, uh, flyers on that how to sign up for that we highly encourage everybody to sign up for that uh, the we're really working to try to get enrollment higher it's called rave smart 911 uh, and you can get uh, those kind of 911 communication uh, alerts we're also uh, the Lynn Public School has just updated their website we are in that process as well over the next few months, we will hopefully be able to launch a new website. In addition, we are working on a, uh, an, a, an app, a mobile app that's accessible by website as well, but primarily an app uh, that is uh, similar to Ray, but it will also allow folks to input information, and it will allow folks to sign up for push notifications um, where, where folks can get alerts from the city that may not rise to the level of the emergency that the Smart 911 is, uh, but are important that folks can opt into nonetheless. So certainly something that we are uh, looking to improve. Okay, so for the for the for the chief, um, what uh, my my son is a student at Thurgood Marshall and is now afraid to walk home from school. What are we doing to address that? And certainly, we, and you, we heard the. the Riverwalk program talk about the impact on kids and they pick up information everywhere and, and we want to be paying attention to that as families supporting your children and be aware of that and uh, be open to the conversations to support them individually. 
from our point of view in the police department, when we hear something like that, it's as if it's our own kids as well. We, we are committed to doing whatever we can to help kids feel safe coming to school, go, leaving school, and being in school. Uh, we have a very dedicated staff, and they work very hard at that. I talked earlier about some of the directed patrols that we're adding in the school areas at dismissal time, uh, and about some of the overtime patrols, both plain clothes and uniform patrols to increase visibility, while also having the ability to identify problems. So that's uh, one of the ways we're trying to address that. We support uh, programs of our own with the Teen Drop-In Center uh, on Friday nights at Dr. Larry, and we run, teen, we run uh, student drop-in centers at the middle schools, Breed and Thurgood Marshall, typically during the school vacation period, so kids have a safe place to go and play then as well. And we're always looking to expand on those resources and those options while also trying to uh, have relationships with programs like the YMCA, the Boys Club, and others, so kids have a safe place to go and stay. Uh, those are some of the, the ways we are working on this, an enforcement level, but also the support level and the uh, providing safe space for kids. The next one for the, for the chief, I think it's a great idea to have a police officer in every school. Uh, and you touched on the school resource officer program. Can you say a little bit, just uh, reiterate how that works and what that is? Sure. So we've had SROs um, off and on for a very long time, but they, for a number of years now, we've had them and they've been assigned to the middle schools. And that's because research showed that was the most effective age group for the SRO program to target. Uh, and it's worked well. Uh, it provides a sense of security, it's a safety, uh, prevention, and intervention. Uh, the SROs are able to provide uh, anti-gang education, anti-drug education, and bullying education. They build positive relationships, and to be honest, they become personally invested in the school community uh, as much as any teacher or administrator. So we support it tremendously, and we are now looking to expand it to the high schools. But we do have to um, assess our personnel resources, and at, at this time we have committed to doing uh, an additional SRO at the English High School, but we hope in, in the months and year ahead to be able to add them to the other high schools, but that's a work in progress. We got one more for you, Chief, so. <laughs> um, and actually, in full transparency, these are all pulled from questions uh, that were submitted. This one I added myself, uh, but I think it was a, a point you touched on that I'd like to just uh, reiterate for folks. What, what can the community do? How can the community be uh, helpful in, in, in supporting the police's work? Uh, so, on my odd project, I wrote down neighbor helping neighbor. Uh, with a very bad drawing of the city of Lynn with High Rock Tower. Um, I talked about it earlier. I asked for your support in these investigations, and you responded. Uh, Captain Kelly, who oversees our criminal investigations, and knows it, is overseeing these recent ones. Uh, let me know. We got a tremendous response. It's been very helpful with the search for video, um, tips, and other information that has allowed these investigations to move forward. So the one thing you can do, continue to be a resource for us. But you have to initiate that. You have to, if you have information, bring it to us. There's, an, there's ways to do that anonymously. We left some sheets out front um, that give a list of ways you can share information. You can also go to our website, uh, www.lynnpolice.org, and you can access uh, text to tip and other uh, resources there to share information. Uh, and it's also just, if you see something, say something. Don't wait for it to get bad. It also can be helping out your neighbor and building community spirit and cohesion because through that, the problems don't fester and don't become greater. When we're communicating with each other, when we're working together, when we're speaking and hearing each other, that is part of how you help us have a safer community. Thank you. I, I also had a high rock tower in my artwork, but I thought, I thought yours was better actually, so don't worry about it. <laughs> Um, before, we've got a couple of questions specific for the district attorney. I also would like to just recognize, because we recognized some of the officials earlier, that we, uh, uh, Councilor Hong Net has been able to join us as well as uh, Councilor Nicole McClain. So, uh, district attorney, what, what will be available for the, for the victims of these crimes? Great, thank you, Mayor. 
When somebody becomes caught involved uh, by virtue of being a victim or a witness, oftentimes they've gone through some traumatic experience. And what we know is that when that person also has to go to court, that can be even as daunting as what they've gone through. It can be a very difficult time. Court can be a scary place. One of the things that, that we have done over the years is develop what we call the Victim Witness Services. We have an extraordinary group of men and women at the Essex DA's office. We're in every court, and we will literally walk that person through the court process, all the way from being with them at the very beginning. They have a right to be at every court uh, uh, arraignment. If there's a, any type of, of um, court hearings, they have a right to be there. They also have a whole array of services, whatever they need. We deal every day with folks that are victims of domestic violence, victims of theft, victims of violent crime. There isn't anything that these folks haven't seen. Maureen Leal is our director of Victim Witness Services. She does an extraordinary job. When I first got this job, I asked a lot of the uh, folks in the office to talk about a little bit about their job. I wish I could share with you, if we had time, what the Victim Witness folks wrote about and the extraordinary work that they do making a difference. My message to you, if you do become court involved, either as a victim or a witness, you will not be alone. Thank you. Thank you, District Attorney. And, and uh, the District Attorney's Office has been, has been really helpful in helping make sure that those families get connected because we often want to make that effort um, over and over again to make sure that people know that's available. We, we really appreciate that. Thank you. Um, okay, uh, Superintendent Dr. Alvarez uh, covered a lot in her uh, statement, but just uh, uh, a couple questions specifically. Um, a lot of the, the the themes that we've been seeing in, in the responses have been about uh, education and prevention and, and around programming for teachers. And so, could you talk a little bit about about that? Programming for teachers or. Oh, teenagers, okay. Um, absolutely, so what we intend, of course, to do is, in re restorative practices is really implementing, um, you know, what are our equitable, like, taking, taking solutions and applying them equitably to um, incidents when they occur. So, in other words, when we have students that commit infractions, for, that would normally get a disciplinary action, and we go from, just an analogy, from zero to 100, right? Sometimes our students are not learning anything, but here's the punishment, and where is the lesson? How do you recover from that? And so what we really want to in, it, be impactful about with our students is for them to understand that when we make mistakes, right, we have need to learn how to recover from them. And it, that, that's a part of the resilience on how we teach adolescents that in grades six through 12 specifically, um, how, do we, how do we engage with them in those conversations? It's not just about disciplinary action. There is progressive discipline. There has to be, right? There is no place for violence in our schools. We cannot tolerate violence in our schools in a sense where we make it acceptable so that a student brings a weapon and that nothing is done. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying very clearly is that we must have that education to be proactive and have the conversations with adolescents to make sure, and elementary students, of course, but in a different right platform. And so we have an incredible clinical team um, which has expanded over time, as well as our teachers who are constantly doing part of that character education of being able to have these conversations of, you know, how do we respond when things, um, how do we resolve conflicts? How do we mediate uh, with our peers versus reacting with violence? And so I think that that is essential um, and is going to make that culture shift and change among our students uh, and our students within our schools. Thank you. So uh, another question for your for your team uh, that uh, I think would be helpful is what and has come up. What can families do? to help keep kids safe? 
Absolutely. So I think you know there are, there are a number of things that we can do to keep um, our students safe, and I think uh, education and conversations in the home are key. Um, perhaps, uh, Tina, would you like to elaborate on some of the strategies that maybe we could use and we could talk about in terms of identification of some of the behaviors, too, that we may be seeing at home that are key indicators that something is wrong, right? When something is wrong and a student is um, displaying that they're fearful, that they're, um, you know, or have depression, they're dealing, they're struggling with something and they don't know how to respond to it, how to speak about it. Maybe that's where, could you talk a little bit about our clinical piece and maybe um, how our clinicians work with our students in that way and how they can also, parents can reach out um, to our staffs and clinicians to make sure that we, we engage those students immediately. Hi everybody, my name is Tina Hufnagel and I work in the district. Um, so the wonderful woman that spoke, was it Liz? Yes, Liz. Um, she uh, presented some tips from uh, her, the, the work that Riverside does and um, that is echoed by a um, handout I brought that's on the welcoming center's table from the National Institute of Mental Health. So um, it was great to see that um, you know, we're all in alignment about best practices but um, I'm going to just be um, just so brief and, and basic, which is our kids are feeling stressed and our families are feeling stressed. When we feel stressed, we feel a little bit out of control. And so what we do kind of naturally is try to double down in a sense and control more. And it's just so important that we realize that and um, understand it and have conversations with our families. Um, everybody has a very, have core values uh, for their family and it's just so important that you um, have these conversations with the kids and please know, uh, Dr. Alvarez spoke about our amazing clinical team. I'm really proud of them. We've been able to increase our clinical staff to 99, um, 96 clinicians and then three administrators. And um, that brings us to a place where we can comfortably um, support our kids, um, tier one, tier two, tier three. Uh, we're very proud of that. To access our clinical staff, you simply have to go on the website and um, read from the SEL about going to your school, making a phone call and asking the clinical supervisor to get back to you at the school where your child attends. We have clinical supervisors at each school. So that would be, I don't have the you know, list to rattle off, but you can find that on our website. Um, I don't want to get too, too wordy, because I can get a little wordy sometimes, but uh, please know that we are not only here to support your children, we want to support you. We have partnerships throughout the city with Elliott and Lincoln Community Health Center. Riverside has responded periodically to our schools, and it goes on and on. Um, this community is wealthy in our resources. And the core resources are amazing family from all the different cultures that are represented in Lynn. And so um, it's been an honor to serve in the Lynn Public Schools for 21 years and to see this work grow. So thank you. And I'm available at any time. My contact information is under the SEL department of the website. That's helpful. Thank you. Thank you for the, to the LBS team for that. <clears throat> so another uh, question that we received uh, is, should the city consider a trauma-informed team response when these incidents happen? Um, one of the uh, 
on the, the resource list, the, the, the Excel list uh, that is on the table out front of all the different resources, it starts with ongoing violence efforts and a lot of the, the police um, groups and, and others uh, are listed there and mentioned. Um, it runs through youth engagement at, at LPS with some of the Limp Public Schools programming and, and beyond and so into the, the various after school programs. And then the final section is supports available for people impacted by trauma. And the first one listed there is a partnership between the Lynn Community Health Center and Lynn Police Department, the Adverse Childhood Response Team which exists to provide follow-up services for, for children impacted by traumatic events, uh, known, by the, known by the acronym, the ACE team. Uh, so that's one. And then the other uh, effort I would point to is uh, the, uh, the city's work in establishing uh, what was originally uh, performed by the, the Lynn Racial Justice Coalition in an unarmed uh, crisis response team, an independent unarmed crisis response team. And that, that work is, is ongoing and, and making uh, real and meaningful progress. Um, another one, so has anyone talked about metal, metal detectors for schools? And uh, I, I'll, I'll feel that and say that certainly it's something that's been looked at. Obviously it's something that is uh, uh, a strategy that's that's been adopted by other communities. I think uh, the, the, the thinking has been that uh, the, the, this protective sweeps policy is a more effective uh, and um, less disruptive uh, strategy to, to make sure that we're keeping our schools safe. And so that's, that's the answer on that. Um, and then how can we help, these are some of the cards, how can we help families in crisis, drug addiction, et cetera? So um, in addition to, Going back to that list of the uh, resources for uh, supports available for people impacted by trauma, one of those um, sections here is the uh, Lynn Community Health Center, the Elliott Community uh, Behavioral Health Center, as well as Bridgewell all provide mental behavioral health services and their numbers are there. Uh, and then certainly on uh, substance use disorder, those those providers as well as others in the community um, and, and you know, we, we uh, certainly can help share more specific information for anyone that is looking for it. So, one other thing I wanted to do before we open it up is invite uh, a couple representatives from a group that has been working on exactly this issue for a very long time, they care deeply about it, uh, and are important partners uh, with Stop the Violence. So I'd like to invite uh, Antonio and Counselor Fred Hogan to share. These past week, three weeks in Lynn has been terrible. That's what I want to say. Um, nine years ago, one of our sports players was involved in a shooting. And we came together, uh, stopped the violence committee, we formed it immediately. We got right on the streets. We started helping kids. I joined in with Antonio. We put together a powerful committee that we thought we could get out and reach the kids. And um, we're a proactive organization. We're not gonna stop doing what we're doing because these guys wanna think they're gonna take over our streets. We're gonna keep fighting for our streets and our kids, all right? We are not gonna stop doing it because these guys think they can take over our city, all right? Tonio's on the ground, we have a big committee and we got people involved now. We got Lisette, my man Mr. PSA right here. He reached out to me, she's doing us a walk, a walk for gun violence, all right? We didn't tell, hey, we joined, come on into our meeting on Monday. That's what we did, we had a stop the violence meeting Monday, she came and joined us and we did that. He reached out to me already, he has some ideas, we're gonna get together and that's what we're looking for. The foundation is built here in Lynn, we have programs. But everyone here, we can jump out and help and build these programs and make them better. The Lynn YMCA, the seventh and eighth grade program, free memberships, they're gonna be looking for volunteers. So if you wanna help your community, go down to the YMCA and volunteer. And that's where it is right there. Those kids are gonna be needing help. They're gonna need people to talk to. They're gonna need mentors, they're gonna need role models. And that's what you do. You get out there and volunteer, and we're always looking for help. Because your idea will be the next idea that saves a kid's life. I had a kid call me and say, Fred, I put down a gun for you. I put down a gun, and now I'm getting 
getting married, and I'm not going to be a victim, or I'm not going to be in prison. Because that's who's affected. It's the shooter and it's the victims. Both families are affected because they're both loved on both sides. And that's what we have to understand. So it takes all of us to, pay, to join in one of these organizations and help out. Just thank you guys. And we are not going to give up. We're going to stop the violence. And we're going to keep saving kids. And that's what we're going to do. You know, it's, I, I, I'm, I'm a man of very few words, right? I don't, I don't do a whole lot. I don't say a whole lot. It's real simple. How is it that somebody from outside the city can come in and start something, right? People that know me know. I don't. I, I just go. I, I don't do a whole lot of talking. I don't do a whole lot of pushing. I just go and I do. Whether I'm with a team or by myself, that's it. It's real simple. Show up and put up, real simple. So we talk about, we leave it up, how can we leave it up to these men and women when the city is ours? Period. We talk about we wanna help, step up. It's nice to sit at home, turn the TV on, oh my God, and then shut it off. And yet we're out here doing this. And then we wanna come in the next day and say, oh my God, did you hear? Well, yeah, I was there. Where were you? Just show up. You want to do something? Join me. We did it, and we continue to do it. And yet 15 years later, I'm still here doing it. People ask me, how do you do it? Don't just ask me. Grab a pair of sneakers, and let's go. Show up. Councilor Hogan, thank you, Antonio. Thank you, the entire Stop the Violence uh, Committee. What's the date of the march? The 23rd. The 23rd. Coming up on the 23rd, uh, there's going to be that march. I invite all of you to, to join us. I also know that the, the council has planned uh, at one of their next upcoming meetings, um, a, a subcommittee meeting uh, for public safety that, that Councilor Fio chairs, that they'll be the, hearing an update. And, and we're hoping to have uh, some some more formal proposals that we kind of talked about tonight and based on all your input to, to bring before them. And I know that they uh, are ready to do uh, whatever they can to help and support as well. And we appreciate that. Um, so, thank you to the, everyone that has uh, helped us answer these, these questions, uh, and w w again, we have all your questions, um, but for those of you that, that have not um, uh, had their question answered yet and would like to uh, ask a question, please uh, let us know. I got a question. Start right there, yeah. I haven't heard you say anything about jobs for youth. That's number one. Yes. These youth gotta do something. To stay out of trouble. Jobs. I haven't heard you mention that. Two is all you have to do is run right around the city and see the mess that's in the city. You run, you run down some street where the Lynn Tech is, these kids gotta walk on the street because they can't walk on the sidewalk because the cars are all blocking. Even even a citizen on wheelchairs don't have access to that. I called your office and expressed my 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 views on this. I haven't heard from you yet. Now I get to talk to you. But when we pick up the phone to call you, there's no return at all. At all. I talk to your pocket department, right? Absolutely no, no results. These officers are doing a hell of a job. A hell of a job. Now we need you to act. Thank you. Thank you. So the question, the question about summer jobs. You know, you know I'm not so happy with you. Thank you. Summer jobs, clean up the city. You ride around this city, and you should take a, a, a portion of the city and say, I want to concentrate on this. Let's clean this up. Thank you. So the question about summer jobs uh, is an important one. So the city community development program runs uh, a summer jobs program every summer that we're uh, really excited to, to fund. We have had great success over the last summer placing uh, teens in, in summer jobs over the summer through community development, also through parks and Reckland Housing runs their own. That's a program that we actually have worked. Okay, thank you. 
uh, that we that we work with the Workforce Investment Board on, and we actually had a conversation just a couple weeks ago with the, the, the State Executive Office of Labor and Workforce Development about, about how to grow that program. Another jobs for, for young people program that I want to highlight is a partnership with uh, ROCA, and ROCA is here tonight, and we appreciate their, their work, uh, and we've been thrilled to launch a jobs program with ROCA for uh, at-risk youth. Uh, we're partnering with our Department of Public Works. Uh, and this is a, an investment that we're making through American Rescue Plan Act funds to uh, help our DPW operations, because certainly keeping the city lean, uh, clean is a top priority of, of, of mine, of my colleagues, uh, of everyone uh, that's working on this issue. And uh, the ROCA team is gonna offer those work opportunities in addition to uh, helping us keep our city clean. Another program that's upcoming with respect to jobs, and this is also something that's helps with city operations, uh, is that we are working with the uh, Workforce Investment Board to launch a free course for folks to acquire their commercial driver's license. So obviously the, 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 the city is in, uh, th th there's a workforce issue across a lot of industries that are struggling to hire, a lot of city operations feel that, and DPW is one of them, and, and one of those barriers is the CDL license. And so uh, in, in the coming, uh, we, we, the, the, pro the information's already available, we have flyers, so uh, if you're interested in that, uh, please contact our office, it's a partnership with the WIB, uh, folks can get their CDLs at no cost to them. Yep. Uh, hey. Thank you. Uh, yesterday, one seventeen, I had to drive um, one of my students who needed an ambulance to Salem Hospital because I was told by the amazing fire department that we did not have any available ambulances. So that's scary um, for many reasons, but in my experience, especially with working with gang violence, it gets worse before it gets better. And so my question to you is, do we have a disaster action plan that actually brings in other ambulances from Salem or neighboring townships when we have a shortage? Like, what, what are those agreements? And if we don't have them, how can we work as a community to get them? Is this a funder problem? Is it just a call? Like, what can we do so that if our, our babies are harmed, we can actually get them the help that they need? Thank you for the question. Uh, Absolutely uh, a very concerning the situation with uh, the ambulances. Again, similarly, uh, facing an industry facing workforce problems. We work with Cataldo Ambulance Services on their ambulance. Uh, the fire department is terrific. They're not here tonight, Representative, but I'm sure you could, we can have a more specific conversation with them. Uh, the other thing I mentioned is that we made a uh, award to the Lynn Community Health Center through the ARPA fund, $3 million, for them to, to build a uh, new building here in the city of Lynn, and one of the goals for that would be to open uh, an emergency room in the city of Lynn, uh, which would help uh, provide those kind of resources as well in, in emergencies. Um, so, thank you. How many years is uh, this question is actually for the chief. But, um, do you think you have enough police officers, or uh, you need more? Especially, um, I, I want to know how many Latino police officers you have in your in your department. Please, uh, I just need to know, please. So we are staffed for 199 sworn officers. Uh, and we are not there right now, and that's because of the challenges that we've had uh, workforce uh, turnover uh, transition in the last several years. This has been uh, another nationwide issue, um, but uh, I will say that every time we've gone to the mayor uh, with a hiring request, he's approved it. And we're continuing, when the new exam lists come out, uh, we process the individuals. It's about a year from the time we start the processing till we can make appointments and they can go to the academy and hit the street. That takes about a year. Um, I do believe as our city grows, 
as we have uh, more housing units and more people and more traffic and more cars, I think there's going to be a need for more sworn officers in our community. Uh, we are uh, also trying to uh, identify te technology and other means and even non-sworn positions that can help us with some aspects of our operations. One of the things we try to do with some of our recruitment efforts is to re reach out to communities of color to get uh, representative um, candidates that are consistent with our community. We want more and more Spanish speaking offices. I do not off the top of my head have the number. I can tell you that we have somewhere in the area of 30 to 35 offices who can speak a second language. The vast majority of them are Spanish speaking. We do have Spanish speaking offices on all three patrol shifts and in several um, special units. Uh, but yeah, we need more because obviously that's a significant representation in our community. Yeah, right here. Uh, so the question that I had, it's not really a question more than it's a statement. Um, for those of you that don't know me, thank you, Fred Hogan, for introducing me. I go by the name of Mr. PSA. I'm a mentor, uh, and we put together live events, music events for anybody who has something to do. My question, and I'm not sure if it's more of a question than kind of a statement, is how many of these kids have somebody that they can really relate to, right? <laughs> They don't have too many people that look like them. Like, and I'm not saying anything about color or anything, but to be honest, a lot of kids are afraid of the guy in the suit or the guy with the gun and the badge. There's not too many people that look like us that are sitting here that work in these places. It takes time. Like, it, for me to get to where I was, and again, I was an at-risk youth. Fred Hogan knows me. A lot of people know me. I was in a lot of trouble until I found boxing programs and people to come to me and say, listen, you're not gonna go and get into a fight today. You're gonna go to a basketball court. But these kids don't have that in Lynn. And I'm not sure if anybody really sees that. And you see it on Facebook and Instagram and all the people on all the pages and they talk, oh, Lynn, Lynn, the city of sin. It's really not. It's really about what you put into Lynn and you'll get that back out of Lynn. I've been in Lynn for like 10 to 15 years and I haven't had not one issue of it whatsoever. And when I'm able to speak to them, listen to what I'm saying. And I think a lot of the problem is they don't have people that look like them, Hispanic, or speak Hispanic, street looking. Everyone is suit and tie, dressed up, and they look like they can't trust them. A lot of these kids, you don't know what they go home to at the end of the day. We need programs for these kids to be in, from school to the program. Programs with people that look like them, that can sit down with them, do these problems, have conversations with them. I know that back in the day, I didn't like talking to too many people, but when I went to Beverly Public Schools at one point in time, I got to know an officer by the name of Officer Long. And when he sat down with me and said to me like, listen, I'm not what you think I am. I'm here for you, and I didn't understand it, but the more I got to talk to him, I understood that he was from a street back in the day that wasn't a good place, and people judged him before he got a chance to do things. We gotta start getting people that look like these kids to work with these kids. You want the respect of the kids, get them people that they can get the respect from. And for the big homies out there, all the people that are putting the battery in these kids and charging them up, how about you get off your couch and you come to these meetings and you speak up and you speak life to these kids because they're losing their life, look at them and use it. And it's getting a little bit ridiculous. Thank you so much. Thank you. It's, it's a great point. Certainly a goal of ours to continue to diversify our, our workforce. Uh, and, you know, just in terms of the youth programming, there are certainly programs in the city, and some of them are listed here, and we certainly need more. Uh, and so I think one of the things that Councilor Hogan mentioned is that the YMCA is looking for mentors, and I think that's a great start for, for, for exactly that. So thank you for that. I have a question. Please go ahead. So what happens when there's a victim who's scared of retaliation and just because he, the person is scared of retaliation doesn't want to cooperate with the authorities and they shove him and brush him off the shoulders? What happens then? What is there for that child or for that student? I, I, don't, I don't think I heard you completely. So if so you said if you're a victim. A vic if there is a victim, who is scared of retaliation, yeah. and you guys are they are talking to the person, talking to the person, and the person is telling you guys this, what is there for them after? When you guys just brush them off the shoulders because they don't become a snitch because they're scared of whatever is there because they, not, they don't gangbang, but the, the ones that are attacking them is a gangbanger. What is there to do next? So I, 
a few different things. So our, our officers oftentimes, depending on the nature of the call, will try to separate people so they can give them a private space to be able to share what exactly happened without doing it right in front of their offender. So that's one of the strategies we use. Sometimes our officers will even make an arrangement to meet them or talk to them later on. It's another strategy we use. Um, we will also in encourage people to reach out to us on their own later on, and then we can go back up and do the investigation. But then if but that person tells you guys they are concerned of retaliation and putting their family in jeopardy, and then you guys just forget about the whole scenario, what happens then? If we just, I'm sorry, I didn't hear you. If you guys just forget about the whole scenario, then what happens then? Well, I, I think we don't, I, I would say in my experience, and I think this is representative of our officers, we don't just forget about what happened. But we do have to have probable cause. So sometimes we'll look for other individuals in the area who may or may not be associated with the people and try to get a witness statement, and then we can act on the witness statement. Or sometimes we'll, as I said, try to arrange to have the victim speak to us later on. Uh, retaliation, I understand. I understand it's a real concern for people. I will say that in my experience, people are far better reaching up and reaching out to get help and get support. Her DA Tucker talked about the victim witness services that are available, and we can. there's a number of protective order options that are available to people, and we can help them through those measures. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. I just wanted to also point out the Chief Sullivan is here. Okay, Chair. Um, the only other thing I would here. Um, Mark and I were the your neighbor. Um, I really wanted to just reiterate what Mr. PSA was saying because uh, just listening to the conversation, there's a lot of concerns that were, were I think, uh, missing the real root of the issue. Um, you look at nationwide, young boys, young men are failing. They're not learning in school, they're not going to college, they're going to align themselves at unprecedented rates. And a lot of the men who could provide mentorship are sort of being pushed out of society as well. And they don't have the support. They don't feel comfortable enough to even mentor these young brothers. Um, and so I think for me, it's really an investment issue. I mean, there are countries with tons of guns like Switzerland, but look at them. Or if you look at Swampscott, you look at Marblehead, why is it us? And it really comes down to investment. Like, I'm 31 years old now. I've been in the city. Um, I, got, I came here in 2000. Throughout my life, I've witnessed many issues. I've been shot at myself, leaving parties, at school. I grew up with these kids. I, a lot of them, unfortunately, are in jail right now. And each and every single one, the media would demonize them, call them monsters, whatever it was. But they had real issues at home. We failed. And it's not about these more cameras, all these things. That, that really just turns me off. I'm, I'm chilling over there, um, you know, by SF Street, where some of my friends are living. They had nothing to do with any of like this, and I'm watching just cops day at night, flashbacks in our face. That won't make me feel safe. That won't make me feel comfortable. And a lot of us feel like that, but we don't feel like we have the support to even say that. And so I guess, you know, I just think it was PSA to say that, that I really, um, and I guess the, my question for you all is before any decision is made about cameras or police sweeps or anything like that, that we have more conversations like this and we give the men, especially the men of color in the city, the opportunity to be mentors. Um, because mentorship for me, like I got to where I'm at, it's not going to look like this. I keep it a book, it's not that. It was going to look different. And you all have to, if you really want the results, you really need to provide that support. So, um, and yeah, I just want to leave it off with that. Like, before any decision is made like that, please, I hope we have more conversations like this. Because I can do it. I mean, the more people see that way, it's not going to make me feel safe. And a lot of girls feel like that too. Thank you, Marvin, and I uh, you know, really appreciate that that input. Uh, absolutely, always open to, to, to feedback and additional conversation. And, and you know, I want to point out that the measures that we're talking about aren't weren't just that. So we also are talking about it, increasing those times of investment, and certainly invite uh, you and, and, and Mr. PSA and, and other folks to to, to to be a part of that. And I think the YMCA is a great place to start there. Uh, and uh, they're also not mutually exclusive too. We certainly want to be uh, reaching folks and creating. 
uh, creating a culture that allows folks to be heard and feel comfortable uh, becoming a part of that. And so uh, I'm very excited to, be, to, to work with you, to, with others to, to make that possible. So I appreciate that. Thank you. Yeah, right here. Um, my name is Roberto Balon Sanchez. I'm not here for to ask a question. I'm actually here to be part of the solution. Um, I want to tip my hat off and say kudos to everybody that is doing something. Um, and I'm glad what my brother here just said. And I want to elaborate on on the Lin Lin city of sin, right? Uh, I'm a believer in the Holy Scriptures. I believe that there's life and death in the tongue, very powerful. Um, you can speak life and you can also, you know, um, condemn life um, in the tongue. So, I again, I am Roberto. I'm representing uh, uh, Kingdom Basketball. We are fairly new. Um, it's a skills and drills program. We are free of charge. We are trying to give back to the youth in this area. Um, I'm also a head uh, ba uh, basketball coach at Lynn Classical. Um, and again, I want to be part of this solution. So I have a couple things to say, if I may. Um, and I'm also looking, because of that, I'm looking for the blessings from the mayor and from Mrs. Alvarez. Uh, that I may go into some of these schools and implement a new club. So for me, um, along with my program, which is Kingdom Basketball, our slogan is pray hard, play hard. So I'm looking to implement prayer. So again, if I may have the blessing from the authorities to be able to implement a prayer club into um, Lynn Classical, Lynn Tech, and Lynn English. I would like to start there. Um, I'm not as big as I would like to be. We're fairly new, like I said, um, because especially because I don't have a facility, and that's not my main point today. Don't really care about that. I'm, I know that I'm going to get one sooner or later, um, but that's my main point, and I want to elaborate and I want to leave off where my wife left off. She actually made the news. She's the one that said, this is not Lin Lin, the city of sin. We're not going to accept that anymore, right? Sin is actually the root cause of everything. It starts, it's in the scriptures, and it's the root cause of all evil that we see. So we need to do away with that, right? Individually repent for our own sins, and then as a community, we should do that as well. Um, having said that, I have scripture to read. Um, just give me two minutes and I'll get through it, please. So in Proverbs chapter 29, verse 2, it says, When the righteous are in authority, the people rejoice. But with the, when the wicked beareth rule, the people mourn. And I say that not to point fingers at anybody here. Again, I tip my hat off to everybody that's doing something. We cannot just blame one individual for... Um, things that are occurring, um, but I, I, this scripture was in my heart because um, I wanted to pinpoint it towards our federal government, right? You see who's the leader of the free world, and he's not capable. He's not capable of being in office. That's my opinion. I know everybody has their own, but I think it trickles down. So when the righteous is in power, the people rejoice. When the wicked is in power, the people mourn. So I want to move on from that. I have two more scriptures to read, please, if you could bear with me. Um, my second scripture is in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12. And it says, For our struggles is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark, dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. So I believe the Lord gave me this verse also for today. Um, like, I, like I was saying, we're not pinpointing the finger at one individual. This is a spiritual warfare we're facing. Yes. It starts yep. there, yes. right? We're all spirit beings first before we see each other right now in, this, in the earthly realm. So that's why I want to implement prayer. Um, I remember the last um, 
stop the violence walk we had last year because of the shooting at um, the Shoe City. I finished there at the gazebo, and that was my my point that I wanted to make then there too, is to let's implement prayer. It's very important. We, we are in a spiritual warfare. So um, I have another scripture, please, if I may. And it's in Second uh, Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14. And it says, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves, pray and seek my face, and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear them from heaven and forgive them of their sins, and I will heal their land. Amen. So I'll leave it there with that scripture. I believe if we repent, we come together to this truth that the Lord will intervene and he will heal our land. Yes. So no longer Lin Lin City of Sin, it is now Lin Lin, the city of the king. Yes. That's what it needs to be. King Jesus. Yahweh. The Alpha and the Omega. Thank you, Mayor. Hi, everyone. I'm Brendan Crichton, your state senator. Uh, thank you so much for being part of this conversation. I'm joined here by Rep. Jenny Armini, Rep. Dan Cale, Rep. P. Capano. Uh, so we represent you all at the State House. And uh, mentorship was brought up a few days by the last three, three speakers. And I appreciate you raising that issue. And certainly it's something the city of Lynn does, does its best with, with limited resources. But our, our role at the state is to really advocate for more funding, for more resources for all those. And, you know, we've made increases over the past. We finally got the, the highest level of funding ever for the Mass Mentorship Program. So this is an organization that trickles down. It may not, you know, affect every mentorship program, but it's something that it's a priority of ours. We'll continue to try to get more funding, but also for the after school programs as well. So uh, please reach out to us if you have questions or concerns at the state level. You know, we're here to make government work for you, and we can't do that unless we hear directly from you. But really appreciate you raising the mentorship issue. It's crucial in this fight. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Crane. So I, 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 I let the gentleman know right here, and then we'll go to uh, where my chief of staff is with uh, John, and then we'll go up to the counselor field. Thank you. Peace, everyone. Say peace. 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 Proper education always corrects errors. Proper education always corrects errors. These are my brothers in spirit right here. My brothers in spirit, we should all have brothers in spirit. I'm here with my son, Justice. He knows that his name means rewards or penalties for one's ways and actions. And I think to what you were talking about, I think we're, we're witnessing penalties right now for our ways and actions. Now, what do I mean by that? What I mean by that is that we're not taking, I don't think we're being accountable enough. Now granted, this isn't to place blame. This isn't to say that things are happening to us because we're not doing enough, or maybe that is what I'm saying. We need to be more accountable, especially the men in our community, especially the pastors, especially the fathers, especially the uncles. We need to be more accountable. And I think we've done a lot of talking in that vein. I have a lot to say, but I'll leave it to this one message. I feel personally that we may not be saying the proper things to these young men who are committing these atrocities because it is young men. In my opinion, I think a lot of these young men, they have no purpose. In other words, they're rudderless. So what is the message potentially that we should be giving to these young men who don't have purpose, who don't know what they're doing here, who don't know how to contribute? Maybe we need to start telling them what their purpose actually is. Maybe that's what's missing in their lives. Maybe we don't have enough mentors or, or men or families telling these young men that their purpose are to be leaders, are to be protectors of the family and the community are to be the providers, are to be the ones who set the direction in this community. So I share that, and I hope that you share that amongst your peers, your friends, your neighbors. Let's start to spread that message personally. Let's start to give these rudderless young men, let's start to give them that direction. Let's start to be the wind in their sail. 
being the wind in their sail has to do with that. It's what I teach my son. He's 11 years old, going on 12 in December, but I've been telling him for years what my expectations of him as a young man growing up to be a full grown, a grown man, what his purpose is in this life. His purpose is to be a protector, provider, a leader, a shining example. The sun shines bright, right? The sun shines bright. We can't dim the sun. So we gotta continue to shine bright. We gotta continue to be that example in our communities. So with that, thank you. And I wanna thank you guys for holding, holding this forum. I think this is gonna go a long way towards us finding a solution to our problems. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Over here, yeah, thank you. Hi. Um, sorry, I'm a little shaky because it's kind of cold back here. Um, so I'm a member of the community. I'm a mom of an eight-year-old boy. I have family and I have friends here in the city. And the one thing that is really frustrating me is <coughs> touching on what a lot of people have said. It takes a village. People need to stop being scared. People need to stop turning their heads. Right. If people need help, we need to be there to support one another. There are so many resources in this community, but there's also people that don't know or understand what those resources are for multiple reasons. Either they don't have the time because they work multiple jobs, there's a language barrier, or whatever. But we, as parents, as members of this community, need to help each other. If you see a kid struggling, and this starts at a young age, this starts in elementary. We see kids being bullied in the playground. There are teachers, staff members, that don't know what to do because they're scared of the repercussions. We need to be the ones to help one another. If we're too scared to help our neighbor, to help somebody who doesn't understand because of the language barrier, we're not gonna get anywhere. And so my question really is, can we start moving some of these resources, some of these programs, to the younger age groups because kids are being exposed to all of this at a younger age. Mm -hmm. They have social media starting in elementary school. They got cell phones. Not all of them do, but a lot of them do. And that's enough for them to see and be exposed to all this negativity, all this bad behavior. This affects their mental health. It affects their schoolwork. And again, not everyone is fortunate to have their parents there with them all day after school because they're living their lives, they have to work, they have to support their families. And so I think a person does start in elementary school. So what can we do to help those teachers? Because they're also so overworked. They're understaffed. I know the social workers at some of these schools have so many cases, mm -hmm. they can't get to all of the kids. Kids that really do need the support, but they don't have it. They try and they can't. So it's not just on the parents. It's not just on the teachers. It's on all of us. What can we do to help them? Thank you. That's a great question. We, we, we said we're going up there, but before we start, I just want to re respond and, and, and uh, you know, on, on a touching on a theme that, that Marvin had mentioned about the continuing the conversation. One of the things I, I hope and expect comes out of tonight at a minimum is these opportunities to continue these conversations and you know clearly uh, one of the themes that we were talking about is the availability of, of programming for, for, for youth particularly for, for for boys and men but uh, but for the youth more broadly and, and, and the, you know the increasing um, uh, onset at an earlier age of some of these, these these challenges certainly something that we've you know recognized in the public schools and I think the team has done uh, a great job of thinking about how to develop programming, particularly for that, that middle school age, and, and have uh, recently added some more athletic offerings and programming at the middle school age. Um, but obviously there's a lot of uh, more we can do, and I think you know maybe one of those upcoming conversations will be an opportunity to focus particularly on that issue, because you know it, when, you, when you walk out here, I really hope you do grab the list of programs. There's one that uh, has the websites and the content information. There's also a summary of with you know paragraph describing each of the programs uh, that are funded by community development because there you know there are programs out there for, for for youth and young people and there needs to be more and there also we need to make sure that people are aware of what exists and 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 then makes it become easier for us to be aware of what gaps are and how we can fill those gaps and so i think that's a really bright area for us to continue to uh, explore and work together on so thank you back here 
I thank you. Uh, what's up, everybody? Let's keep doing it. First, um, Jack, I want to apologize to you. John, I want to apologize to you. I was heartbroken and upset at first about what's happened, what was going on. Because as, as someone who was extremely passionate about the city, I've come to you and I spoke to you a few times again. And I apologize for uh, being upset and lashing out. First, I would like to thank the police, uh, the prosecutors, Officials, we are doing the job, doing a great job. It's not just on you, a lot of it is on us. And when I say it is on us, I mean, folks have to pay attention. Um, my brother, uh, Mr. PSA, Marvin said, bro, in this community, I don't like saying community of color because we're culture, we're not crayons. We're people of culture, we're not people of color. So having said that, like what Mr. PSA and Marvin said, nothing against it. the police at all, nothing but that. When we're having certain outreach, like you did speak before John and Jared, and people, they're a little nervous going to a city tax the time, and they're a little nervous going to a uh, uniform office. So me being a, a figure of the community who's, you know, been to prep school, who earned a visual scholarship in the whole world, travel. I want to be a mentor for these people. I was in the Lynn community. I, mean, I was in the Lynn public school system for eight years straight. I worked with autistic kids in the neighborhood. They said the worst of the worst. But they're not worse when they come and talk to me. Like a lot of these kids talk to me. Fred and Antonio, they're doing an amazing job, but they only can do so much. You know what I mean? The YMCA, the Boys Club, they only can do so much. And there's people like me, legit. I don't know anyone in America who loves their city as much that walk 30 miles to eight hours straight to bring awareness. I did I walked 30 miles from Lynn to Lawrence to bring awareness for our city. And I have no problem because we'll support any that I'm not getting any resources or support from to the GIF 51C3. So this is what I'm talking about as well. Like people like myself, uh, Marvin, Mr. PSA, I have a little trust. So to, I have the infrastructure set up to help all of you and work with all of you. So my question is, can we finally start working together? When we first came up, I asked you, I just need to see the tape. I don't want to I want to help you guys because I know what it takes. The kids talk to me just like they talk to Fred, just like they talk to Antonio. A lot of the, a lot of the youth will not, even if they are in the program, speak to officers or speak to people in the student ties. They just don't feel comfortable. Just, just reality. But moving forward, I don't want to, my heart can't take it anymore. Like I'm too grown to be crying. I'm too grown to uh, be losing, losing sleep. I got, I got a, a new job at Bush Academy up in New Hampshire, and I talk to those boys every day. Like it breaks my heart because they bring us to the weekend, whatever. But I want to work with the police, so I want to work with you, Jared. I want to work with you, John, as well as Fred and Tony. But we need to do more. Like, I, Andre Norman, I said it again. Everybody, please look him up, AndreNorman.com. He's the man that we can bring in. So, Jared and John, please, I hope we can work together soon and bring Andre in again and, and fix all of this. Because it, like I said, it takes a village. You're doing a great job, you're doing a great job. But collectively, we need to do this together. Police are doing an excellent job. Again, it's only good for everything, but all of us, you know what I'm saying? Sorry. All of us need to uh, use each other's resources as a group instead of not that new individual, but now that, you know, we've lost it. Sorry, with this microphone. But the loss of these young men, hopefully they, they don't die in pain and they bring us all together and then we can be extremely make something happen for our city. Because this is we shouldn't have, we should never have any more of these again. I mean from people dying well. We should be all proactive moving forward, but the, we shouldn't have these anymore. Maybe before having and hosting them, but please bring them in the circle so I can help some more. I appreciate that. Yep, yeah, right here. 
Testing, yes. Good evening, everyone. Wilson, and yes, I am a member of this community. Um, this is an issue that is dear to my heart. I will be posing some questions, but not looking for you mayor to respond. I want to ask these questions for all of us to let these questions sit with us and marinate in our spirits. So we are all concerned about the wave of violence in our community. This is one of the reasons why we're all here tonight. It will take all of us to come together to discuss solutions. This is the first step. So I want to applaud all of you, all of us tonight for being present. Again, please take a minute to think deeply and honestly about these questions. And I'm not looking for a response tonight. Let them marinate in your spirit. First, who are the examples, role models of our children, students? What is going on in the homes, the states, the country, the world at large? That is probably affecting our children. Has there been changes in our city that could be contributing to the rise of violence here? One important question, one more important question I would like to pose, and that is, as adults, how do we deal with conflicts? Do we think negative behavior or our negative behaviors as adults could be affecting our children? Are we overloading the minds of children with more than they are maturationally capable of handling? Are we teaching or modeling what conflict resolution looks like to our children. My hope and prayer is that this will not be the last gathering for us to come together. And like someone said, and famously, there's this famous quote that says, it takes a village to raise a child. Let us continue to work together to raise our children. They are our children.
I've raised five children. I got one left. Gracias a Dios. They're still on this earth, but there's a parent at home right now in our city that has pain that will not go nowhere. And I think that what it's gonna take more than anything to begin with is us to challenge ourselves as parents. I know it's hard because I do the same thing you do. Go to work every day to pay them bills, and every month you sit down and you scratch your head and figure, try to figure out how you're gonna get it done. But I'm gonna tell you right now, literacy is big, okay? When you learn how to read, you learn how to read laws, you learn how to read people's opinions, you learn how to read dissent. You need to be able to accept dissent. And this is the issue, and Ms. Judith really, really touched on it, okay? It's how, how you take on that conflict, okay? So I'm issuing a challenge to all you fellow parents, fellow grandparents, fellow uncles, aunties, you know, because that's the village that we're speaking of, okay? All them football games that we go to on Friday nights, Sundays, all the baseball games in the spring. I see Coach Avery here. He's another one that's done big work in the, in the community. It's, it's men like him that I've been watching since I was a little boy. Please, challenge yourself as a parent. Find time to sit down with your child and talk about the daily events. What is going on in your life, baby? What is going on? And if they don't want to tell you, then start investigating, because that's your job. That is your job. And if they ain't doing it in school, go to school and ask them, what is going on? Just like we're here today. But it has to be a challenge. And it starts with reading. We're mentioning about all the community resources that we have. We mentioned Lysoa, Roca, Stop the Violence. There's also another organization that I'm a part of, and it's called The Real Program. And in The Real Program, we, we promote literacy. We promote education. This is what we need. And so much so that someone like myself that grew up here underachieved and made all kinds of mistakes. I was on the wrong side of these guys for a while, and I'm sure they saw me around, you, you should know. Right. <laughs> so that's exactly what I decided to do in 2020 when all the craziness was going on. I said, you know what? I ain't gonna talk about it no more. I'm going back to school. So now when I walk by these same young folks that I know their parents, I know their grandparents, remember I was heated, I didn't wanna be here. <laughs> but now I don't want to leave here. I don't want to leave Lynn. I ain't never leaving Lynn. Even if I have to relocate, I ain't leaving Lynn because it's already here. Please challenge yourselves. So much so that I will be a teacher in this school, and I mean in this city, in some school somewhere. It doesn't even matter which school I land in, it don't matter. All I need is those credentials. I'm halfway there. And every young person that I come in contact with, I'm gonna tell them it starts there. Start reading. If you don't read to your child, start doing it. Find time. If you can't be there for dinner, be there for breakfast. If you can't be there for breakfast, be there for lunch. There's got to be one point in the day where you sit down with your child and you ask them, what happened today? Que paso hoy? That's it. It's communication. That's the beginning of every solution. Communication. That's why we're all here. Thank you for listening today. Is that, uh, yeah, Natasha, remember, uh, Hi everybody, my name is Natasha Veggie Madry. I am on the City Council in Ward 4. I've been in Lynn for 25 years. I am a mom of five and also a grandmother. And every time I turn on the news, 
breaks my heart. We must do better in our city. We need to invest in our youth. We need to have more youth jobs, because there's not enough. We need to have more programs for our youth. And I do acknowledge all the great programs in this city and all the great work that's being done, but more needs to be done. I, it breaks my heart um, to, to attend wakes and for these, stu these poor students that had to lose their lives, it's just not okay. No mother should have to bury their child. Uh, my heart goes out to those families. We need to do better. It's not okay. Invest in our youth, please. And I would also like to say thank you to our mayor for having this meeting and all the elected officials that are here, that are here as well. Because it's so important to be here. And not just one meeting, I think we should meet monthly. Um, I think we need all these
by the parents. Another thing is, I know that there is no mental hospital for children, but I'm gonna use as an example. I have a tenant who is struggling with a girl that she's, when they moved into my house, she was like seven years old. Now, this girl has been expelled from school many times because she has mental issues. This girl needs help that she needs to be either at a mental hospital or some program that can take her and help her mom. This girl abuses not only the mother physically, but her little sister as well. Many times, I have been in need of calling the police, to get the ambulance and get that little girl because she has been beat up by her sister and the mom is afraid of her daughter. What kind of help is this mother receiving when many times when the ambulance come, they take the girl that has a mental issue and me as a landlord have to take care of this little girl because the mom has to go to the hospital. The city needs to be involved in families that need help. Don't take parents, arrest them, and bring them into court and, and for them to go in just to parenting program. No, the parent is not just a parenting program. It has to be a family program because if you don't include the problem, you're not gonna have the solution as well. The problem most of the time is the child that is rebellious and doesn't want to take the discipline from the, the parents. So what happens? The kids end up in the system, and this is what we deal with. Help the family. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, just to respond to that, um, in, in part, I want to just bring people's attention to um, one of the programs that I mentioned with the Community Behavioral Health Center has a specific uh, team for, for youth, uh, for mobile crises for youth. Uh, that's Elliott Community Behavioral Health Center uh, as, a, as a youth team, but you know, appreciate the point and the feedback. So I'd say Reverend Burnett, and I'll go over to here to, to John. Yeah, okay. Good evening, everyone. Uh, first, I would like to commend Mary Nicholson and all of the folks who are here from the city, all of you all here, because everyone has said it indeed takes a village, uh, not just to raise a child, but a village to be a community to love the family, to love one another, that violence and Uh, through the grieving process. And it's not just those who are grieving 
screaming from violence, but those who are just stressed out, the Lord knows we got a whole lot of stressed out folks. Stress from things that happened from grief, from loss 20 minutes ago, two days ago, two weeks ago, 20 years ago. But what it is is a place for people to come and to be able to share a story, to just sit in silence and listen, to hear a song, to hear a poem, and to be collectively on a journey of healing. It is not a church service. Let me say that. It is when we were back at the Lane Church, Zion Baptist Church has started this program in our sanctuary. However, it has now moved to the YMCA. So this is another thing. The Y is another thing. We haven't had a representative here, but the YMCA is really stepping up in many ways to support uh, the people. And so they have also stepped up to host a Can We Talk program. And that happens uh, once or twice a month. We're coming out of the, our summer season. Uh, but I want you to stay tuned for that because it's a really powerful program. So, so I'm also part of, I'm Reverend Adrian Barry Burke. I'm also an employee and children's friend. I'm a, I, so I'm Reverend Adrian Barry Burke. I'm an associate member, associate pastor at Zion Baptist Church. We also host in our fellowship bowl Hall and can we talk? And so we are on for next week on Tuesday night. Uh, there's a live meeting at 6 30. And then the conversation starts at 7. So all are invited. Uh, we ask that you be preferably 18 years of age or older, but we're not going to tell you no if you get to the door and you're 15. Amen. Um, I'm also going to say I'm a counselor with Children's Friend and Family Services, and we provide counseling for whole families. We provide counseling for children as young as four years old, all the way through. I have a client who's 75. So I want to add, make sure we're on that list. Okay. Children's Friend and Family Services, you can reach us. We, we are 781-593-7676. Uh, Daylene Fasden is here and is part of that team. It is an amazing community outreach person. Where do you go? No. No, I wasn't. That was a
and we need multi-prom solutions. And we need invest in the, I don't know how many of you said that you know, we're having the increase in the uh, overtime for the police officers, and we're having the, the, the cameras. I don't know how much that costs, but I don't know, like 10 times more money that you spend on that for all these other uh, community programs and systemic change so that we can create a community that is safe and loving and peaceful for everybody. that you can have 
a family gathering, a celebration, a party of some sort without being sprayed by bullets. That you can go to school and not have the expectation of, of getting stabbed. We should have, that's a reasonable expectation for any parent to send their kid to school and expect that they will come home in one piece. All right? That you can walk outside of your door. Right now, I, I'm the executive director of the Community Minority Culture Center at 298 Union Street. Right down the street from us, a young man went into a store, and this is a convenience store, as you know, right on Union Street, and stabbed somebody else with a tacked him with a knife. So it's all around us. None of us are immune from this. So we need to come together and help one another. It's evident tonight that people showed up that we care. And we had a conversation with some more community people here. Um, earlier we had the, the pastor from Mount Olive Church, with God in Christ, he was he had to leave early. We spoke with the pastor from um, Greater Bethlehem Temple. He was here. We have Reverend Adrian Berry Burton from Zion. She represented uh, Dr. Kirk Byron Jones. She's here. We have the Reverend Brandon Hickman Mayor from Bethel AME. So again, the faith community is behind us as a community, behind the mayor, what he's trying to do. They're behind the police chief and what he's trying to do. And all the district attorneys and everybody else is trying to find a solution. We, we may not find it tonight, but people are putting forth the effort to let you know that we are concerned this is not what we want for land. We want a safe community that we all can thrive in. And I, I thank you for your time. Appreciate it. and a few of our leadership also showed up. And we had a great time discussing and sharing concerns. I'm grateful for this meeting because a lot of the answers uh, that we're, we were trying to find were shared here. But I would like to echo the one suggestion that got everybody's applaud, and that was by the pastors. And all the concerned parents were happy, and I'm happy to share. And that is that we would love to see prayer in schools. The benefit of prayer, the benefit of it bringing us come, it brings peace, and it builds faith. We are privileged in our community to have 77 churches, I believe. We are blessed. We have a powerful community of faith. So my question is, how possible would it be that our, church, that our schools would allow prayer within? I know that's a, that's a tough one, but I would love to put it out there. Our parents would love it, and it would definitely be of great help. Thank you. Thank you, Walk here. Thank you, and thank you for, for sharing that feedback. Um, happy to have further conversation with you. Uh, obviously, as many of you know, there, there's uh, First Amendment issues when we're getting into a, a question like that. Uh, but there's a, a lot of the values that you talked about in terms of offering time for reflection and support are uh, values that, that certainly uh, have a place, and so it's certainly open to a further conversation. Thank you. Yep, yep. Yes, uh, good evening. I want to thank you, Mr. Mayor, and Chief Reddy and all the officials for putting this event together. Um, I, am, I took some notes, I'm very excited. This was a very nice event for sharing information and sharing grief. I am very excited about the next meeting. Hopefully that meeting is gonna be about solutions. We need to get together and talk about how we can fix this. So, 
I took my uh, plan and wrote down some ideas. Perhaps one of you can take some ideas down, and maybe the next meeting could be all about sharing solutions. Uh, one solution I want to bring to the table is can we create a police, hot, a police hotline? There are some folks who may have some information, like in my day it was called drop a dime. But maybe they're afraid. They don't want to say, who am I speaking with? They just want to pass on some information. Um, we could increase policing, uh, community policing in the high crime areas. Back in the day, the police officers were walking around the neighborhood. If there's a comfort in sometimes seeing a police officer in your neighborhood of high crime, can increase, get some more police in the, in the streets. These, these are things that won't take a lot of money. Uh, here's another simple one. There are, I live in downtown Lynn. I go to work down Washington Street. It's dark, it's dingy. Things, but things happen in dark, dingy areas. Could we increase the lighting in the streets? Simple, it, it would decrease the crime. Increase the lighting, in, decrease the crime. And finally, develop a, a community police com, uh, committee relationship. In other words, increase the communication between the neighbors in the police department. Either on a monthly basis, a periodic basis, things like this, we get to know one another and, and it, it makes things better. So again, I'm looking forward to the next series of meetings and let's talk about solutions. We, 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 we grieve, um, we, we complain, let's talk about how we make it better. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. Uh, and thank you, everybody. Thank you so much to all the officials for, for being here. If folks still have a question, there's more cards out front, and that, that form is still open, and we will certainly be collecting all of this feedback. Uh, and if you have the further thoughts, please don't hesitate to, to reach out. I, again, just want to express uh, my absolute support for this community, my, my gratitude for all of you and being part of the solutions. These are incredibly uh, difficult situations, and, and uh, fear presents itself in those kinds of situations and all working together we're mobilizing hope to push us forward and I thank you for being a part of that tonight thank you